So I very intentionally have titled this talk Cancers and not Cancer. Lots of different things are in here. Um, the um, background is actually kind of interesting, and I'll tell you in a little bit why it's there. So Jim Lindsay is a 72-year-old guy. He's of Northern European heritage. He's got COPD. And COPD is a chronic disease that happens mostly to smokers. He's had a heart attack. He's had type 1 diabetes. He had a basal cell carcinoma. And basal cells are a very localized cancer. They usually don't go anywhere. But a squamous cell cancer that occurs in the lung is a much more serious condition. And Jim had this six months ago. Uh, and he needs treatment. Jim's wife died five years ago from lung cancer. She was always also a smoker. Uh, he has smoked two packs a day for 52 years. So he's got 104 pack years. You just multiply the packs per day times the number of years to get pack years. And he drinks one or two six packs a week. And he's got a bourbon every night as he uses his, his nightcap. So he is on treatment for his lung cancer, and unfortunately, he got six weeks of treatment and didn't respond. And uh, then he had to be put on hospice. Now, what are things we could have been doing previously, and what would way be ways that we could maximize Mr. Casey's treatment? So what could we have done before his cancers developed? <clears throat> How could we have figured out a way to uh, figure out how to catch the cancer earlier uh, and what if he was uh, having radiation or chemo and what what would happen during the hospice phase so prevention primary prevention is preventing something before it happens secondary prevention is preventing uh, um, uh, problems after the patient has developed the diagnosis stopping it from turning into something more serious and tertiary prevention is once they fully develop the disease um, but have um, needs for rehab and maximizing their function so again cancers a basal cell cancer is a very different situation than a squamous cell cancer in the lung uh, pancreatic cancer is a much more serious cancer uh, than a mild thyroid cancer. So how do cancer, uh, cancers develop? Well, normal cells develop. So they form uh, into stem cells. Uh, and then those stem cells differentiate into specific types of organ cells. And then once they form I gain full maturity, they stop dividing. Now, if you've lost cells, you can actually reactivate and try to repair some cells. But many types of cells in the body do not have a significant amount of replacement. The problem with cancer cells is they keep dividing. And because they keep dividing, they create um, uh, excessive growths. Um, you've probably heard of You've probably heard of Henrietta Lacks, and if you haven't heard of Henrietta Lacks, <clears throat> I would highly encourage you to read the book about her. It's an excellent book, um, and uh, I would highly uh, recommend it. So um, cells keep dividing, and when they keep dividing, they get bigger, and when they get bigger, they take up nutrients, and when they take up nutrients, uh, nutrients uh, don't go to other organs and then they get too large and they press on things and then they eventually cause severe disability and death. Now there's some other growths that happen in your body but they're nowhere near as out of control. Those, these are benign growths. These are small tumors which grow. They're usually encapsulated uh, and they do not cause anywhere near the amount of problem as cancer cells. Cancer cells usually have poorly defined margins and are not encapsulated. This is actually where the term cancer comes from. Cancer is from the uh, Latin term for crab, and crabs have these long pointed things that stick out. And that's what cancers do. They're not encapsulated. They're not inside something. They basically uh, are putting their claws and their fimbriae out and um, uh, going into other tissues and, and causing problems. Um, hyperplasia is an overgrowth of normal cells. It is non-cancerous. So an example of that would be benign prosthetic hyperplasia. 
Metaplasia is when the cells convert from one type um, to another. These can be precancerous because if you have a lot of GERD and uh, your lower esophagus is constantly bathed in acid, it may convert into a, uh, a stomach cell. And so instead of being an esophageal cell, it converts to a stomach cell. If it's switched back and forth two or three times, sometimes that switch turns into a cancer uh, and those metaplasures will turn into dysplasias, which is an actual or abnormal variation in the cells. Uh, these are um, on the way to being cancerous and then an anaplasia is a cancerous uh, cell um, and uh, can be very serious. So what happens and that causes the cancers to grow? Uh, a lot of theories. We think that there's some oncogenes. Maybe certain people have a tendency to create cancers. We think there's mutators. So exposure to cigarette smoke, exposure to alcohol, exposure to certain things. And then there may be some other things that just promote the growth once they've happened. So you have a cancer develop and then once you've had it developed and you're exposed to um, cigarette smoke or some of these other things, it may just cause it to grow more extensively and faster. Some of the mutators and promoters, viruses, drugs and hormones, chemicals, radiation, and the sun. Uh, risk factors, we think of these as being unmodifiable, um, basically because um, uh, they can't be changed without uh, um, surgery or major um, societal shifts. And so this is heredity, age, gender, sex, uh, and poverty. So one of those, some of the risk factors that you can change, you can decrease your stress level, you can change your diet, you can change your occupation. Um, you can avoid certain infections such as HPV using the uh, Gardasil vaccine. Um, you can uh, avoid tobacco, you can avoid alcohol and recreational drugs, you can make yourself less obese and you can avoid the sun. All of these things interfere with the regulation of the cell cycle. So what is the cell cycle? Well, it's a um, throwback to um, you know, basic biology and basically the cell is at rest, then it grows, then it synthesizes DNA, then it grows some more, and then the DNA splits, and then the cell turns from one into two. Uh, this is mitosis. Um, the only place where meiosis happens is in the, uh, the, the genital cells, the uh, sex cells, um, and they end up with half the number of chromosomes that um, a normal cell would. But in a normal cell, it's going to divide by mitosis. So what happens in the person? Well, usually the cell cycle ends. Uh, they divide until they get fully grown. Uh, the problem, again, in malignancy is there's no control. Um, these cancer cells actually may break off, go through the bloodstream, get in different parts of the body, and then keep growing there. We call that metastasis so that if you have breast cancer and it breaks off and it goes in the bloodstream and it gets into your brain or into your bones, that's a metastatic lesion. How do we decide how severe a cancer is? Well, cancers that are well differentiated are easier to treat. And by well differentiated, we mean how much it looks like the original tissue. So if you identify a cancer in the brain and it looks a lot like a breast, breast uh, tissue, it may be easier to treat than one that looks totally anaplastic, that looks almost like a regular stem cell. Uh, also, when we're looking at a cancer, we want to see how big the tumor is, and we definitely want to see if it has metastasized anywhere. Carcinoma is a cancer of an epithelial tissue. A sarcoma is a cancer of a connective tissue. So bones get sarcomas. Bones don't get carcinomas. Pancreatic tissue gets a carcinoma. Uh, some other cancers have a less obvious name, such as lymphoma, uh, which you would think just is a uh, tumor. Oma means tumor of the lymph glands. Uh, but by definition, essentially all lymphomas are cancers. So where can you get cancers? Anywhere you grow cells. So um, how can we treat cancers? Well, we can do surgery and remove the uh, area that has the crazy division. 
We can do radiation and kill the rapidly dividing cells with radiation. Or we can do chemotherapy. And since this is a pharmacology course, that's mostly what we're going to talk about today. So drugs that fight cancer. Um, I would highly recommend a book called The Emperor of All Maladies. Uh, and I have actually posted an excerpt uh, that the author is reading on the blackboard. It's a great book uh, worth reading. Uh, Ken Burns also did some PBS specials based on that book. So when you have cells and they're rapidly dividing, we can try to kill them. Uh, cytotoxic agents uh, fall into these four major categories, and we'll talk about each one of them in a minute. Other cancer treatments are hormonal. We can actually create a hostile environment for the cells that divide based on the hormones in the body, because usually many cells that divide, divide based on a signal from the hormones. We can also use steroids. Steroids are actually great treatments for lymphomas because they really do interfere with that uh, lymphatic and, and lymphocyte tissue. And most recently, we've uh, started treating them with monoclonal antibodies. And that's a monoclonal antibody that you see actually in the background. And so basically what happens is the cancer cells aren't usually recognized as other cells because they are the body's own cells. But what we figured out how to do is we figured out how to mark them using monoclonal antibodies. These antibodies attack to cells that have a cancerous uh, um, characteristic. Uh, and uh, when they are marked, then the body's natural immunity will break them down and get rid of them. So cytotoxic. Well, the original one, as you can read in the Emperor of All Maladies, was this folic acid one. And basically, it, it is a folic acid analog that gets into the cell and stops the cell from dividing. So it, it's going to interfere with all the cells in the body, but the cancer cells are really the ones that are most actively dividing. Um, so it's going to have its biggest impact on that. Uh, other things like purines, other things can also be identified. The alkylating agents actually add an alkyl group to the cancer cells, um, which also cause, causes them to be attacked and die. Cytoxin is an example of that. Cytoxin is a nice medicine um, because it can be given orally. Um, many of these um, agents have to be given intravenously. Platinum is a fascinating medicine. Before platinum treatment, uh, cisplatinum, platinol, um, uh, cancer rates for testicular cancer were substantially higher. And we've cut these by about two thirds um, to the point where um, cancer um, of the testicle um, has about a 1% death rate. Uh, with late diagnosis, it's about 1.5%. Uh, so there's really very little difference between early diagnosis and late diagnosis, which is um, one of the reasons that. Um, many people feel like testicular self-exam probably really doesn't have a place. Um, uh, the uh, USPSTF, the United States Preventive Services Task Force, says there's not enough data to really say, but it's pretty unlikely with a uh, low death rate. Uh, last year, 400 men died of testicular cancer, the exact same number of men that died of breast cancer, and we're not encouraging men to do breast self-exam, are we? So the mitotic inhibition, um, basically you can stop it at that mitotic stage of cell growth, and the vinca alkaloids are effective, um, including taxol. Um, so how do hormonal treatments work for cancers? Well, mostly they work for cancers of the reproductive system, just because those are the cells that get the signals to replicate based on hormones. So in a patient who has prostate cancer, if we give them Lupron, which is a GnRH inhibitor, it'll decrease their androgens. And uh, prostate cancer is very dependent on androgens. It won't grow unless it has androgens. <clears throat> Years ago, the treatment used to be removing a man's testicles and putting him on DES, which is a uh, estrogen treatment. Now we basically do the same thing, but in a more sophisticated way um, by blocking the GnRH. Uh, aromatase inhibitors um, do the same kind of thing. So aromatase is uh, sort of a precursor um, in the development of estrogen. And if we inhibit it, uh, women won't uh, produce as much estrogen. 
and therefore certain breast cancers which are estrogen receptor positive uh, will um, be much less likely to occur uh, and recur if we put the woman on tamoxifen, which is an example of an aromatase inhibitor. Actually, technically it isn't, but uh, it basically does the same thing. So steroids. Uh, steroids interfere with the growth of lymphatic tissue. So uh, for lymphoma, there's Hodgkin's lymphoma, and then there's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, and they're also used to decrease swelling in some other cancers. The monoclonal antibodies, as we noted, are designer antibodies basically designed to bond to a cancer cell and then allow the immune system to destroy it. We're also using this monoclonal antibody technology for things like multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, migraines, and many other diseases. Uh, I think for your generation that this is going to be a, uh, a major element of pharmacologic treatment. So again, just reviewing, for the cytotoxic chemotherapy, each drug interferes in a particular part of the cell cycle, and they kill any rapidly dividing cells. Well, based on that, we should be able to figure out where people are going to get side effects from them, right? So where do you have rapidly dividing cells in your body? Well, you produce a lot of hair, and so you do have to have cells that replicate and produce hair. And so because of that, oftentimes these people will lose their hair. Your stomach actually has to replicate cells because of the acid and the uh, activity. And so a lot of times these people develop nausea. Uh, your mucous membranes are constantly repairing themselves. And some of these people develop mouth lesions, uh, irritation. Uh, stomatitis is the word that means irritation of the mouth. Stoma is a word that means opening to the outside. So we, we know a stoma can be created in the abdomen through the intestines, but technically the, the stoma that all of us have is, is the mouth, even though we refer to it as stomatitis. We don't usually refer to the mouth as a stoma. Uh, and then reproductive cells. So uh, especially women that are having um, uh, cancer treatment and also men, uh, if you give them cancer treatment, it may damage their ability to uh, produce children later on. So uh, sometimes they'll actually harvest uh, sperm uh, from a man before they do treatment, or they'll also harvest eggs from a woman before they give her treatment. Uh, and white blood cells. White blood cells are also damaged by um, um, these drugs because they are constantly being produced. Uh, interestingly, now we have a drug which um, stimulates the body to produce more white cells and uh, increases um, the, the circulating white blood cells. That drug is called Neupogen. Uh, there's an equivalent drug for red blood cells because you can also develop anemia related to these, and that drug is called Epigen. So what about radiation? Uh, again, cells which are dividing are the most likely to be damaged by radiation, uh, and thus you can get uh, um, a good effect with these cancer cells. Uh, and you use a very focused beam, so you get less um, side effects, um, but you can actually have uh, more localized damage. <clears throat> the number one cancer, uh, number one killer for both men and women is lung cancer substantially uh, um, uh, an issue. Uh, mortality obviously is different than incidence. Incidence just means that somebody gets the disease. Mortality means they die from it. Breast cancer is a, a cancer uh, which is um, also uh, not uncommon. It's the second leading killer in women. Um, and so how can we prevent it? Breast self-exam doesn't have great data, but some people do definitely believe in it. Clinical breast exam doesn't seem to have any data that supports doing it over and above mammography. If you're doing mammography, mammography has good data for anyone over age 50. Between age 40 and 50, the data is much more controversial, uh, although many people do believe in it strongly. Others um, question it. So what about liquid tumors? Well, liquid tumors are tumors which are um, cancers of the bloodstream. And so leukemia is a good example of that. Leukemia just means white blood. And so the usual presentation for someone with leukemia is they will come in 
<clears throat> they will have an infection. They're not fighting the infection very well. And then almost paradoxically, you check a blood count and their white blood count, uh, which should be between five and 10,000 roughly, usually with a good bacterial infection, will be about 15,000. In these people, it'll be anywhere from 60,000 to 100,000. The problem is none of these white blood cells are working very well because they're all very immature white cells. Uh, but they do have very, very high white counts usually um, in that. And there's a couple of different types. You know, there's uh, lymphocytic leukemias, uh, and then there's the myelogenous leukemias. But you'll learn all about that when you uh, review um, those cancers in your adult health course and in your pediatric course. So there's lots of different cancers. Uh, we know that they have this basic pathology of excess replication. Um, many of them have uh, treatment in common. Uh, and we know that certain cancers tend to respond to certain treatments. How do we know that? Just because of experience. We basically uh, keep track and we see that certain cancers respond to radiation, certain cancers respond to chemotherapy, um, certain cancers respond to both. Uh, and only through that previous experience do we know how to treat those cancers. Here's some drugs of the week. Um, trying to keep the drugs to a minimum, but obviously we talked about a lot more drugs than this, but uh, these are some that you can start wrapping your brain around.